Thank you all for coming tonight to this presentation. Uh, I'd like to also thank all those who are attending this lecture via Zoom. Uh, my name is Scott Bradley. I am the executive director of the North Thunder Bay Museum. I would like to begin tonight by acknowledging the original custodians of this land and to pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and the hopes of indigenous peoples. We also recognize that we're meeting on traditional land of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850, and to acknowledge the role of the Métis settlement in the development of our community. A bit of housekeeping. So uh, this lecture is being recorded and is also being broadcast live on Zoom. Uh, for those joining us on Zoom, uh, don't worry, we cannot see your computer, we cannot hear you, whatever you're saying on your microphones. Um, uh, and but we do ask that if you have questions or concerns during the presentation, you use the chat function. And we will have a question and answer session towards the end. So please do enter your questions into that QA function in Zoom. Uh, we will hold in the room, we will hold all questions and heckling until the end, please. <laughs> um, and uh, and then we will we'll get into that. Um, there are refreshments here tonight, so please don't be shy during the presentations to go over and partake. Um, so, uh, this is the February lecture. It is also known as McCurdy Night in honor of Ms. Gladys McCurdy, whose memory funds were donated to the Society in 1975. So, I would like to first introduce our, our, introduce our first speaker. Uh, Sierra has a honors Bachelor of Science in Anthropology and a Bachelor of Arts in History from Lincoln University, and is a recent graduate of uh, the MA program at Lincoln University in History. Her master's research examines the incorporation of multiculturalism in the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society, and her presentation focuses on the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society's role in heritage and citizenship in an increasingly multicultural Canada. So, Sierra. Hello, my name is Sierra Mendes Walker, and today I'll be presenting a lecture on the museum's role in heritage, community, and citizenship. This lecture is based on my MA work that focused on the Thunder Bay Museum's expression of multiculturalism. So here's just a brief overview of what I'll be discussing today. Background, introduction, my theoretical framework, expression of multiculturalism within society, and Thunder Bay Museum's role in community. Multiculturalism in Thunder Bay is disseminated to the public largely in cooperation with the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society. The history of the development in the region is very important to the city's identity, as the most diverse place per capita in Ontario in the early 20th century. The, recent, the region's development speaks to the greater national history of immigration in Canada, which is why it is important that the museum takes part in the conversations around multiculturalism and diversity. Local historians have produced many publications on the working class history, which speaks to the diversity that has always existed within the city. Post fur trade in the late the later 19th century, when the construction of the Canadian Pacific Railway began in Westport, marked another era of prosperity. Further, the construction of the railway called for more workers, including immigrants. Thunder Bay's working class narrative is consistent at its very core as it solidifies that mass immigration occurred in the region and is reflected in the diversity that is seen in the 20th century. Perpetuating that diversity has always, exist has always existed within the North with a population that was predominantly Ukrainian, Scandinavian, Finnish, along with other European groups like the French who were represented, who represented the early Thunder Bay working class population. Thunder Bay has always had a very multicultural community filled with diversity, though in the early years of the city it appeared to be very homogeneous. The museum is able to help cultivate a sense of identity and citizenship within the region by sharing the history and experiences of the community. Like so, an introduction. So, in my major research project, I examined the incorporation of multiculturalism within the, the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society. The mandate of the museum is to serve both the city and the district of Thunder Bay in Northwestern Ontario 
Canada and to preserve the history of the entire region. The society operates as a museum, an archive, and a historical society. And in exploring multiculturalism within the Thunder Bay Museum, I first had to define a role and purpose for the museum. And I did so by exploring the purpose of public history and its relationship to heritage. Then I examined why museums play an important role in spreading awareness and education surrounding multiculturalism. And then I looked at how the museum itself incorporates it. In order to understand the importance of museums within a community and why I chose the Thunder Bay Museum, I will explain, I will explain my framework of analysis. Next slide, please. So first I looked at public history. Public history in a museum is history that is interpreted for the visitor to understand. Its relationship with heritage is simply the allowance of creating a connection with the visitor, especially if they are from the area. Public history grew out of the expansion of museum studies and continues to develop around the world, including South Africa, Australia, and in Canada. While in the 70s, public history emerged as a field, a field of study in the States, in Canada, we see it in the 1980s. However, the practice of making history accessible to the public began much earlier. However, when you see the rise in antiquarian organizations, monuments, memorials, and museums, these, this is really like the mark of when we can say public history existed within Canada. And all of these served as a tool to create better citizens. The goal of public history is to have the community connect with heritage. The role of the public historian is to facilitate this relationship while being cognizant of their diverse audience. So for public historians, the priority is to ensure that history is portrayed in a way that engages and accommodates and connects with the public. And the public historian is constantly trying to find a balance in respect to current political norms and culture while keeping history as authentic as possible. They are always working towards supporting the public's relationship with history and in doing so, their heritage. The public is the key foundation in any field or organization that is dealing with heritage. And the evolution of public history entertains the idea that history should have an inclusive nature that involves discussion of social culture and community heritage. The importance of heritage and its relationship to public history is that it can act as a mechanism to create a connection between people. In Canada, the drive for society to adopt a multicultural lens can be implemented within a museum. As a plural society, the tensions that exist are founded on perception and anxieties around difference. Though Canada has always been multicultural, the adoption of the multiculturalism of multiculturalism within policy as part of the Canadian identity is much newer. And to reinforce and acknowledge the diversity within its country, Canadians need to learn more and engage with history and heritage. And as we said earlier, heritage is that connection. So we really want the, the relationship between public history and heritage to, to be around shared histories or respect for cultural differences. And through interaction exposure to heritage, a connection can be made. And the visitor who's in the museum is able to feel a sense of place and identity within their community. By understanding diversity and the role that immigration has played within the development of Canada, and in the case of my paper specifically in Thunder Bay, a sense of community awareness is, can be fostered. And community awareness can translate to community memory. And based on scholarship that's used in public history, it's instrumental in supporting social memory. Next slide, please. So heritage. Heritage plays an important role in common values because it's, it represents the local environment and the culture of, of community. In the later 19th century and early 20th century, when immigration was increasing in Canada, the unknown impact of newcomers promoted fear in Canadians. The unknown that fueled the fear was perceived threats of liberal values, economic costs, erosion, and erosion of social solidarity. Excuse me. Today, Canada presents its community as a cultural mosaic as opposed to this cultural melting pot. People are encouraged to share themselves and their culture as part of a national plural society, and attitudes towards multiculturalism have become more positive over time. And the uneasiness that remains in existence can be easily explained by perception. 
So the unique ability of museum spaces is that they can enhance a sense of collective identity, collective memory, and social cohesion through programming and exhibitions. There are many kinds of museums, some of which focus on science and, like ours, more of a historic museum that is a place where one can learn stories from a national, provincial, regional, and especially in our case, a local perspective. The role of history is important in a community. By extension, the museum acts as a vehicle to share knowledge that, so that it is accessible to the public. These museums would then highlight the community's identities, failures, progresses, triumphs, and exceptionalism. And the public historic site, the museum, is a treasure fest of history for the visitor and speaks to the importance of, of social public memory and citizenship. Social memory is important to heritage because it's what ties it was ties our communities together. And in the small or local museum, local museums, it's easier to identify heritage because the museum is highlighting strictly its community's past. So another uh, section that I looked at was this idea or concept of local history. So before the emergence of public history, there was another movement which offered an alternative to historical work done in academia, which is called local history. It can be defined as a field of social inquiry, but basically it's enab it enables individuals to understand the systems, cultures, and style in which their society exists. So local history being a micro history rather than an all-inclusive national narrative uh, allows smaller based communities and, and cities to become more intimate with their, with their history and their community. So local historical museums are committed to educating their community by providing opportunities to participate in history. In turn, local individuals who participate are able to feel a sense of belonging. The Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society community policy reflects Canada's adoption of multiculturalism. And it's three pillars, the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society. The three pillars of the society are publications, exhibits, and education. And through these pillars, the museum is able to effectively distribute and share information to the public, i.e. the lecture that we're at tonight. The Thunder Bay Museum aims, aims to provide tangible links to help define its local community as well. Next slide, please. So museums act as a space where objects are stored and the curator is able to create a narrative to share with the public. Michael Foucault, who uh, I used as one of the people to define my research, defines the museum as a space of knowledge. And if a museum is just a space, then the context and the direction should be able to reflect a changing society. Seemingly, museums function as both the epicenter of societal culture, but also an extension of, of its nation. In modern society, it is, it's become the new normal to enforce this represent to enforce multicultural identities. And conversations today are uh, about a community's heritage or culture are driven by multiculturalism, which celebrates inclusivity and the promotion of social awareness. So why are museums important to community and heritage building? Museums, especially local museums, play a big part in redefining community and citizenship by contributing to the local construction of identity. In order for people to connect with history, Accessibility is the most important part of effective public history. The framework in which the political, religious, social, and economic history of the community can be explored can be found in this museum. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the museum and multiculturalism. So memories from the visitor's real or assumed relationship to the museum can be triggered by an event, an object, an image, and place. If a museum, if museums are able to learn and reflect, it makes sense, or places to learn and reflect, it makes sense that a visitor's memories can influence their feelings and project their emotions onto the space. The relationship that exists between people and a museum is a projection of their individual biases and feelings. And the visitor assumes a relationship with the space 
And it is understandable because museums are actively trying to become more personable to the public. The collaborative movement towards the acceptance of a diverse Canada under the Liberal uh, government, government contributed to the enrichment of Canada. And when multiculturalism is discussed in public history, it appears to be a matter of fact that the diversity in culture would be part of the social narrative. In North America, where mass immigration benefited the development of the nation and communities, knowing why immigration occurred and who took part in the development is a necessary component of understanding social culture. In the present context of the 21st century, immigration is still a huge part of development globally. Within North America, and especially in Canada, where multiculturalism is a cornerstone of its national identity. Next slide, please. Oh, my bad. Can you go back one? Yep. Thanks. So uh, I also wanted to take the time to just provide some highlights that I found in my in my research and findings. So the exhibits are at the core of a museum's public image. They define what the visitor sees and how they interpret the museum. The Thunder Bay Museum is no different and their exhibits provide a distinct way to communicate with its visitors. Through exhibitions, individuals are able to experience and learn about objects from the collection with interpretation. The exhibits presented by the museum lend room for a connection between multiculturalism within the city and its people similar to the essence of its public lectures, or even some education programming that highlights the multi-ethnic groups and their involvement within the city. The museum's education department offers a range of engaging programs that include field trips to the museum, spring summer camps, online lesson plans, and a research page for, for teachers. All programs adhere to our current Ontario Ministry of Education's curriculum guidelines. And the education programming at the museum does have some elements that relate to the broader theme of multiculturalism. For example, under programming or under its core programming, they have uh, Ojibwe stories, which pay homage to the local ind Indigenous community, but also draws on the broader conversations of Indigenous culture, while persons around the world acknowledges the broad diversity that exists within the city. I would argue that most of the educational programming touches on diversity within the city, but it doesn't go into explicit detail except for its immigration uh, lesson plan, which includes the ways experiences of immigrants who came to the Thunder Bay region, allowing diversity to be addressed within the region, particularly to school aged students and children. And the Thunder Bay Museum Historical Society is also the largest publisher of books in the region. In addition to the full-length nonfiction books, it also publishes an annual peer review journal, Papers and Records, weekly newspaper articles, and quarterly newsletters. The Thunder Bay Museum also houses a bookstore as part of their gift shop. And their areas of interest for publication include ethnographic history of Thunder Bay and Northwestern Ontario, social history of communities within the city and region, racial archaeology, geography. Geograph geography, pardon me, geology, and fur tree history. Publications produced by the society also aim to bridge the gap between public and history. And an example that is an example of a publication would be Fort William Bulldog's image of an ethnic enclave, Swedish immigrants to Northwestern Ontario, pragmatism and prejudice, the wartime transfer of Japanese Canadians to Northwestern Ontario, 1904 to 1947. Other notable books, Canadian, Canadian memoirs, Memories of Italian Immigrants, Emigration to Thunder Bay from a Small Town, Labor Camp, just to name a few, all speak to the diverse multicultural identities that have existed within Thunder Bay. The museum is able to facilitate a multicultural framework by supporting publications through books, articles that relates to the community, further through their education, and most importantly, through exhibits. So why are museums important? Why did I feel like this research topic was important? Within Canada, multiculturalism is important because it is a, it's part of our, the very fabric of our national heritage, and it's reflected within community. Immigration into Canada increased the diversity that had already existed, and programming that supports the social fact 
helps to propel normalcy and conversations around difference. In the same breath, the museum must be careful not to use diversity as tokenism and embrace all aspects of community. The Thunder Bay Museum has made an active effort to continue to grow and adjust with the changing political landscape. An understanding of heritage in the community, especially in an urban city like Thunder Bay, helps build social awareness, social identity, and a sense of place, which is an important part of citizenship. Communities are made up of many groups, and within the, di and within the diversity, each has its own sense of history and heritage. In order for a person to feel connected to their town, city, or country, they need to feel connected to their environment. And the Thunder Bay Museum is able to do that and continues to play an active role in sharing the diverse history of the community, region, and participating in the broader conversation of multiculturalism within Canada. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sierra. I am now uh, re-energized in my in my love of museums and, and all that we bring to society and our lofty goals. So I really appreciate your talk this evening. So um, next comes the podium. Hannah Johnson was born and raised in Thunder Bay and recently finished her master's in history. She holds an honors bachelor's in political science and history with a minor in philosophy from Lakehead University. Her research focuses on the influence of religion on Swedish culture and its social development in Thunder Bay. Please welcome to the podium, Hannah Johnson. Hello, everyone. So yes, as was already stated, I'm going to be presenting um, on Swedish immigration and the role of religion in their communities. Um, this is inspired by the last chapter of my re major research project that I just completed in October. Um, I'm very passionate about history, and once I started learning more about my family history, it really inspired my topic of choice. As well as the subject of religion, it really does fascinate me. So that's how we kind of came to this. So next slide, please. So this is really kind of what solidified why my research was so important, not just to me, but even with the Swedish community itself. Because um, the first name on there, Gordon Arthur Johnson, is actually my papa. And he, I found his name when I was looking through all the church records, and he was actually attended one of them, and I didn't know that. And below that, Arthur Johnson and his wife Astrid are actually my great grandparents who immigrated here in the 1920s from Sweden and Norway. So just a little tidbit of information. Um, next slide, please. All right. So, yes. As I briefly just mentioned, I was working on this project during my master's the last two years. I did have quite a few barriers in my research, just with obviously COVID and everything. I was fully intending on going to Sweden to do a little more preliminary research on the churches that were there so I could do more of a comparative work, but obviously I couldn't do that. And just with accessibility, with on and off lockdowns and what have you, it was a little hard to gain as much access to primary sources as I wanted, but I was able to get enough to do this research, so I consider that a win. Um, <laughs> when doing my research, I took the functionalism approach to it, which essentially is um, people are influenced by the societies that they're born into. So the fact that these could be like religion, politics, um, media, social structures, all that kind of stuff influences basically how you're raised and how you come to develop within your society. So taking that information and using it to see the similarities and the differences between Swedish communities in Sweden and how the Swedish community developed in Fort Arthur and Fort William was really important to my research because then I could really see how it was similar and how it was different. Um, Next slide, please. All right. So to provide some context, um, religious life in Sweden was, it has quite its own history. So 
before the Viking Age in the year 800 to around 1100 AD, um, the faith of the land was more so like a Norse pagan mythology based. So they had deities and they had other kinds of religious rites, but it wasn't quite like what we see today. And after the Vikings began to do some exploration, they came into contact with the Anglo-Saxons. So they were able to see a different form of religion, which I kind of refer to as more like a medieval Christianity. And that inspired them and they brought it back to Sweden or what is now known as Sweden. And they took a while to implement it fully, but once they did, it kind of became the new dominant faith-based practice in the land. So that remained so until the reformation that occurred in Germany in the 1500s. And once that happened, then the Swedes were very um, intrigued by Lutheranism that came out of it. And so they began to adopt that instead. And this was when they developed the Church of Sweden, which is like the state-run church of Sweden. And this was when they could kind of create an overarching body for Lutheranism in the land. And it was slow to implement as well, but once it fully got integrated by the time immigration really started to North America in the late 1800s, they were able to bring it with them and start their own congregation. Next slide, please. Oh wait, back one, sorry, my bad. <laughs> Ignore that. <laughs> That's later. All right. <laughs> um, so yes, they were coming to the United States and Canada and they were creating their own congregations, but more so with immigration to the United States. Um, they slowly created their own overarching bodies there. So this led to the development of the Augustana Synod, which was created from 36 Swedish and Norwegian congregations. They all merged together and was essentially created so that immigrants could be good Americans, but could also honor their Swedish heritage in a way that was right to them. But contrastingly, there were those coming over to North America as well who didn't quite feel as connected to the Church of Sweden as others did. So they ended up creating what was known as the Swedish Evangelical Covenant, which was basically so they could have another overarching body but was different and they were able to show, like practice in a way that felt right to them um the synod was definitely more stringent of the two as to how you could worship and who could join and under what circumstances but for those who didn't want to do it that way they had another option so that was good for them it definitely um Whichever organization that the Swedes felt like they could relate to would tended to be the ones they joined, but both were viable options, and both of them actually came to be represented in the churches that were built here. Um, immigration to Port Arthur and Port William obviously occurred. Um, starting in like the 1860s is when it really started to pick up into Canada and the U.S. from Sweden, just because before then, it wasn't really as like a mass migration. It was like a trickle of migration. But after that, more numbers started to come more steadily. But then the United States decided to implement what was called the quota law, which essentially meant that not as many people could immigrate there. So people would end up coming to Canada and would either be like stuck here for a period of time or they would just decide to stay. But either way, the immigration numbers weren't always consistent with this because they would count people as they came in. And sometimes they would go to the U.S. from here. But either way, the Swedish presence was established in the region. All right. Now, next slide. <laughs> okay. So, essentially, when they came here, they didn't have their own congregation or their own church just yet. So they used St. John's Anglican for the first while that they were here. Um, essentially, they came about taking care of the Swedes because in the 1860s, there was a intercommunion between England and the churches in the U.S. And so they were able to take care of the Swedes when they had nowhere else to go just yet. But because they were serviced by St. John's for so long, St. John's eventually decided to create a mission 
which would be to create its own separate parish and its own separate church for the Swedes so that they had their own place to go. And so this was the beginning of St. Ansgarius, which is in the picture here. Um, in 1906 was when it really took off and it was giving the Swedes the place to worship, but it would also stay aligned with St. John's, which was also part of the evangelical covenant kind of strain. So they would worship similarly there to how they did at St. John's. They brought in a reverend named Knut Totterman, and he was both Swedish and Finnish. And they funded the construction of St. Ansgarius, which stood on the corner of Seaport and Cornwall up until 2018. Um, parish life here was very much a community, and it was kind of the first of its kind in the region. So I shouldn't say in the region, in Port Arthur for the Swedish Lutherans. So they were able to really solidify their strength as a community. However, there were some issues with some Swedes as they didn't align with St. John's mission and they didn't align with the evangelical covenant. So they ended up separating and forming their own congregation under the Augustine <laughs> Synod, which would be called Emmanuel Evangelical. So the people were divided as to who attended St. Ansgarius. So their membership was not so much stagnant, but not as strong as it could have been at the time. And then they were also having some issues with Totterman himself. He was not very well liked or respected. He was very single minded and was determined to kind of do as he wished. So it had very poor consequences on the church itself. Um, one example is uh, they were very exclusive with their membership. So it would be performed in Swedish so that only those who spoke and understood Swedish could go. And most of the sacraments were only performed for those who were Swedish or Lutheran or both. You couldn't really have anything outside of that. And because of this lack of um, growth, it caused them to struggle financially. And therefore, when he resigned in really short notice in 1912, he left the church unfinished and in massive debt. So it was then sold to the Norwegians who had it for a while after that. Next slide, please. All right. As I mentioned, Emmanuel Evangelical was um, a group that did separate from the parish that was forming at St. Ansgarius. So it was also established in 1906 when some women from the Ladies' Aid decided to oppose the mission being put forth for St. Ansgarius. They ended up bringing in Pastor Chauvin, who was from the Augustana Synod. And they knew it was going to be very difficult to form their own congregation separate from another church and not really having another church to back them. But they knew it was going to be worth it because they would be able to worship in a way that was right to them and they could follow the practices that were right to them too. Um, following this, very shortly after, they also formed a sister parish in Fort William called Swedish Lyon Lutheran, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, parish life for Emmanuel was very much shared with Zion because for a while they didn't have their own location. So they were sharing a hall in Fort William where they kind of all just got together. And so weddings and confirmation classes and other services were all performed at Zion. And the records that I found for them were all together, but I was able to distinguish which was which because it would either say it was from or William or Port Arthur, depending on who it was. So that's how I could tell which congregation each person belonged to. Um, and they did eventually find a building where it would become its home on the corner of Pearl and Fanning in Port Arthur. They also had very similar struggles to St. Ansgarius, just with exclusivity and finances. So their finances was more so caused from the buildings they were having issues with. So they would like start to build one and then something would fall through. So they'd have to find land elsewhere and start again. But like I said, they did eventually find somewhere to go, but it was rough to start with. And then their membership struggled at the beginning because of the typhoid epidemic that was happening. So that occurred between 1906 and 1907. 
And also with the First World War approaching, it was causing like a stagnation and immigration from Sweden. So they kind of just had to work with the people that were already here. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so Swedish Scion had a very similar story, obviously, to Emmanuel. Um, they worked very closely together for a long time. Their church was also delayed being built because of the typhoid epidemic, but it was started in 1909. Before that, they met at a carpenter's hall, and then their church was eventually built on the corner of Marx and Wall Street. Um, they continued to grow as a parish on its own while still being a home for Emmanuel. So it got bigger as the years went on while still being able to take care of their sister parish. However, it did cause some struggles when they had to take care of another congregation as well as their own, but they did try to make the best of it for as long as they could. Next slide. Okay, so where are they now? Um, they wanted to create a home away from home using their Lutheran roots. However, keeping things very Swedish and very Lutheran meant very little room for growth. And so they didn't exactly have longevity on their side. All the original churches that I mentioned are now closed. The Norwegians eventually that had bought St. Ansgarius, they sold it and it was used for religious services until the 80s, which then it was bought privately and it was just never used again until it was eventually torn down in 2018. In the 1960s, Zion actually separated from Emmanuel due to the hardships that Emmanuel was experiencing. And therefore, they kind of went on their own because they were able to sustain themselves without needing to kind of be hindered by Emmanuel and their parish. However, Emmanuel could not survive on their own. So they formed another joint parish with the Zion Lutheran that was in Port Arthur. And they were again left in the 1980s before they became a federated part of the First Norwegian Lutherans, which were then called Our Saviors. And they officially merged together back in 2015. So anything that's left of these original parishes is still being housed at Our Saviors, which is on Barron Street. Um, although the churches didn't last long, the sense of community amongst the Swedish immigrants definitely did. And they needed that sense of familiarity in the new land so that they continued their pride and heritage within the Swedish community that they were building here. And I, like many others, have family members on these pages of the church records. And once I saw my family's name, I knew that this project was going to be important not just to me, but to others in the Swedish community and those who were even just fascinated with it. So I hope this to be the first of many projects that I get to work on. And we'll see. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Hannah. That was fascinating. Uh, so glad you were able to share your research with us. So uh, we're now on to the question and answer time. So uh, Sydney Belouz, who's manning all the technology in the back for us, um, We'll also be pulling some questions from our uh, Zoom attendees. So if you are attending by Zoom and you do have questions, please do use that uh, Q&A function to enter those questions in. And uh, we'll read those aloud and uh, have our presenters uh, answer those. So um, without any further ado, are there any questions? And we'll have our presenters answer those. For the first presenter, um, when we're talking about multicultures and the museum setting, how do we decide, like, and who gets to decide what's actually shown in it in a museum versus what's actually like left in archives? Because after seeing the archives here and seeing all the stuff that they have, and then seeing the museum and all the stuff that they have and how it differs, like, who makes that decision? How? <laughs> so, so. <laughs> I know it's a, it's not, first of all, I'll say it depends, right? First, it depends on the type of museum we're talking about. It depends on the type of content that we have within the museum. And then there's also a team, right? It's not just one individual making that decision. When it comes to 
I want to hold right speak, right? <laughs> but when it comes to um, exhibits, for example, it's not just, it's not an individual saying, you know, going through the archives and saying, you know, I just want to do this, so I'm going to present this. There's a lot more factors going into it. You have to take into consideration the mandate, the values, the mission. And then from there, you're going to look at, okay, what exhibits have, do we already have? And what is my community with? What do they also want? To see? And just because the archives are filled with so many things, it doesn't mean that everything there is connected. Sometimes it can be a little disjointed. So you may see a hundred dolls, but maybe only three of those dolls are part of the Eaton Center's doll collections they had in like the late 19th century, you know? So you can have an exhibit with three dolls, but then how big is that exhibit going to be with your space? It's it's a difficult question to ask because it's or to answer, I should say, because it's not, I can't just give you a straight answer. It really depends on the situation and the, the funding that the museum also has. Does that make you have more questions? No? Okay. I'm like, no. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions for the crowd? I have a question for anyone. <laughs> Do <laughs> you know when kids stop having citizens to it? I'm assuming they no longer have citizens to it. Well, yeah, they're they're not really in service anymore. But I do based on what I found briefly, because obviously that was out of the scope of my research, is they did eventually switch to that, I want to say in the 1920s. Okay. But I can't say for sure because yeah, it was a little. It was briefly read upon. It wasn't so much solidified in my research. So yeah, it did happen at some point though. <laughs> Any other questions? We do it online. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it's for Sierra. <laughs> How might, how might we increase museum's ability to reflect diverse perspectives of community heritage? I think there's a few different ways to go about it. I think the biggest thing to always keep in mind is your community, like your community base, and making sure that we're interacting and seeing really at the grassroots what's going on and what conversations are being had in the community and so we're able to reflect that. Another part of that too is I know that now we have like diversity panels and EDI panels and or boards. Yes, I think those are a great and amazing way to start those conversations. But I think just personally, I want to say just by increasing awareness of what's going on in the community. Who is in your community? How is your community developed? I think once you start to ask those questions, it's not going to be very black and white. You're going to have to start to dig more. And then from there, you'll be able to, to really see the diversity to present it. I think that if you're searching for it, yes, maybe you'll find it, but it may not be presented in, in the way that it needs to. I think when you force certain issues when it comes to multiculturalism, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, it makes it really difficult for the person on the other side to see past any resistance they have. But when you're integrating it, just talking about city development in itself as an example, you're able to see there's so many different players and there's diversity in that. And acknowledging that diversity exists as it is, I think is the first step instead of searching for diversity that you can't see that already exists. Any questions after that? No? <laughs> All right, any other questions from the room? Any more coming in on the line? No. Okay, so I'll, I'll pose a question to, to both presenters. What do you think was the most, uh, the most interesting or the most shocking thing you found in your research? Oh. <laughs> Yeah. 
I'm gonna sit here till morning. It's up. Okay. 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 Not to not to bear repeating, but probably what I found my family in the books because that was I was not expecting it at all, and then I was just kind of like, oh, maybe I should ask Papa what this is about, and then I did. But yeah, it was very shocking to come across at first. <laughs> was was it in family lore? Was was or was it something the family just never talked about? Um. Well, my family's not very like explicitly religious, so it's not something that we kind of just talked about. I knew they came here, obviously, and um, but I didn't actually know much beyond that. And so kind of finding that out was very cool. Have, have they retained anything from that from that early time? I honestly haven't had a very long conversation with my papa about it, okay. but he did lead me to some information that my great grandfather was one of part of the BASA order. So, paper two coming out soon. <laughs> I want to say for myself, an attractive part of my research is how ambiguous everything is. Like, within, like, my theoretical framework was a big portion of my paper. It was two-thirds of my paper. And going through that, I would say the most shocking part was how confused and not confused, how polarized historians are on the subject of public history or what should be within a museum or what's the right type exhibit to have or how do you incorporate museum or multiculturalism within to museum, even finding literature to um to, to support like my my findings that I had within the museum was quite difficult because Museums and multiculturalism are discussed, but how integration is going to happen and what that's going to look like isn't really well explored. It's it's a new era, so I found that when I was sifting through my research, that it was a little difficult to not pick a side, but to determine what side is the is the right side. Like, how do we move forward? Is this the correct way? Is it through public history? Is it through publication? Do we need to have more educational programming? What is the correct method? There is no answer to that. And doing a research paper when you have no distinct answer was shocking in itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Uh, I don't think we have any other questions. So um, I, I want to um, do a little bit of plugs for the museum. So if you uh, if you are attending tonight and you are not a member of the Thunderhead Historical Museum Society, I would encourage you to do so. It is thirty dollars for an individual or forty five for a family. You can certainly sign up for that on your way out of the building by checking in with our receptionist Kathleen. Um, you do get to um, take care of all the benefits that Sierra highlighted, the, the annual publication, the newsletters, access to the museum, and of course, early notice of events like tonight. Um, and uh, while I'm plugging things, we also um, we also are looking for a sponsor for our Free Tuesday program. We wanted to restart that. So if you're interested in becoming a sponsor for our Free Tuesdays, please do see me after the event. Uh, I would like to... Um, give some thank yous uh, tonight for the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society's uh, Programs and Plaques Committee, Dr. Steve Javid, Nick Duplisis, Don Bahuli, and Greg Johnson. I would also like to thank uh, the sponsor of our lecture series, the Lakehead University Department of History, and the Ontario Trillium Foundation for their ongoing support. I'd also like to thank the museum staff, our volunteers, and we hope to see you at next month's lecture when our, uh, they'll be immediately following our annual general meeting at 8 p.m. Tentatively, our presenter is architect Elita Smoke, who will be presenting on Indigenous architecture. And I would like to thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to mention. If there's any food left, that means the staff will get it for free. So that's on all of you. That can happen. <laughs>